Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm going to be trying to present something that I think hopefully will be useful to this group. If you are, you know, doing um, monitoring and you're thinking about using sensors, you know, buoy based sensors, or you're thinking about going out with um, some handheld sensors, I hope that this presentation will give you some ideas about, uh, you know, what's possible and um, you know, what you might be able to, to achieve. So, and, and hopefully some, some food for thought here. Uh, so first I'll kind of tell you what I'm going to try and tell you about. So the first question is, you know, how can we use these optical sensors to track cyanobacterial blooms? You know, if we're, if we're interested in parameters like onset, you know, knowing how long the bloom lasts, knowing what the peak bloom intensity is, um, you know, how, how can we get there using optical sensors? And then I'm going to take a bit of a, of a detour to talk about a somewhat confusing factor, which is, you know, what are, what are chlorophyll sensors telling us, especially um, when we have a lot of cyanobacteria in our, in our water bodies. And then I'm going to try and back out and re reflect on uh, kind of how this analysis can inform our thinking about, you know, regulations, basically. So our, our study site is the Lower Charles River, where the EPA does an incredible job of maintaining a, a really wonderful um, buoy. The Charles River Conservancy uh, has been doing some work there to start looking at swimmability in the river, and that's how I got involved. And of course, the Charles River Watershed Association has been maintaining really great data on this, on this uh, whole river for, for a long time. So this is a really well-studied river. And this is kind of um, the study that we've put together is kind of opportunistic because we've got, we've got great data. You know, let's see what we can do to, to start uh, interpreting some of the output from this EPA buoy. My contribution here really comes from doing um, daily cell counts starting in 2017 and continuing today. So, you know, what, what we use is we use the Cedric Rafter counting chamber um, and we identify the dominant species and we uh, do cell counts of total cyanobacteria. You know, and that kind of gives us something that looks a bit like this. It gives us a, a look at, you know, change in abundance over the season. We really, I mean, I really, really like doing these daily cell counts. It just gives me so much confidence about um, what the bloom looks like. And I've been really surprised over the years to see, uh, you know, even though the water body can, can appear very heterogeneous, you know, very clumpy, some places are worse than others. You know, when you do these daily counts, uh, a somewhat clear picture emerges. The EPA buoy is, uh, is outfitted with, you know, basically every sensor parameter that you'd want. You know, there's a DO meter, there's conductivity, there's pH, and then there are um, fluorescent measurements of both phycocyanin and chlorophyll. Uh, and, and Tom Faber and the folks at, the, at EPA go out and they, they service this buoy, they make sure it's well calibrated, they make sure the data is high quality. Um, and they also collect QAQC samples that are analyzed in a, in a lab. So are a really useful kind of, uh, you know, truth reality check for, for the data that I'm collecting. Um, but, it, you know, if, if folks are used to working with some of these um, optical measurements, you know, the output can look a little bit like this. So this is, you know, a whole summer of data. And this shows... Uh, turbidity, chlorophyll, and phycocyanin, you know, all normalized. So it's just, you know, relative fluorescence units on a scale of zero to one, you know, and, and what I find interesting here is it's just, if you look at something like this, it's just not exactly clear where the bloom is um, compared to the cell count data. And, you know, in literature, there's a lot of different ways to, to get these two data sets to agree. 
but they don't always agree that well. So our project is about, you know, understanding what are the bloom properties, kind of using our cell count data to, you know, unlock um, this EPA buoy data and understand, okay, what does the bloom look like on a buoy? Take a little, a little detour to talk about chlorophyll and then start to construct some models that allow us to use the buoy output so the you know the buoy sensor parameters to estimate um, cell density. So you know in Massachusetts, uh, you know as we all know, we use a seventy thousand you know cells per milliliter threshold to kind of say when we've got a serious bloom or not. And this study is very you know geared towards producing a tool that's compatible with that with that way of thinking. Um, and and we've kind of added a probability. A probability piece onto this to help to help folks interpret the output of this model. So you know, so first, so I'm just going to get right into showing the the results here. Um, we split the buoy data into the bloom period and the non-bloom period. So in this in this case, what we're using is the World Health Organization kind of 20,000 cells per milliliter. In the you know in the Charles River, what tends to happen is the bloom proceeds pretty quickly from 20,000 cells per milliliter to much higher concentrations. So this is a, a useful threshold that's conservative, but really captures the, the bulk of the time that there's a lot of cyanobacteria in the river. And, you know, a, a couple things to, to point out is that, you know, dissolved oxygen concentration, very, very elevated during the bloom period, you know, 120%, it's super saturated. So there's just a ton of oxygen in that upper meter of the river. We also see that the blooms are strongly associated with the very high temperatures in the river. So especially temperatures above 25 degrees Celsius, um, which is really interesting to think about with you know, global warming and with what's happening in our rivers, we know that cyanobacteria can really grow much better at these high temperatures than some of the eukaryotic green algae. Um, and then, you know, finally, phycocyanin, turbidity, chlorophyll, you know, each of these are kind of optical measurements of what's happening in the water. Uh, phycocyanin and chlorophyll are both, you know, fluorescent measurements, so you're hitting it with one wavelength of light, and then you're measuring the um, the excitation, you know, you're measuring a, the output of a second wavelength of light and turbidity, you know, is just a super simple measurement where you're shining light at a little patch of water and then you're measuring how much of that light is scattered at 90 degrees. And um, what's, you know, one of the things that jumped out at us really quickly was how well correlated turbidity and um, cyanobacterial cell density was. And another thing that jumped out, maybe, maybe you're seeing this in, in this data or in this plot, is how strange the relationship is between chlorophyll and the bloom period. So, you know, unlike all the other parameters where the bloom period, you know, you see a higher phycocyanin concentration, a higher turbidity. During the bloom period, we actually see a lower chlorophyll concentration. And, you know, that chlorophyll concentration is either uncorrelated or maybe even has a, a, a very low negative correlation to the, to the bloom period. Um, so, you know, maybe some folks who have been using in situ chlorophyll measurements have seen something like this themselves. So, so the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of unpack this chlorophyll issue um, and you know what's wonderful is that the EPA has this terrific data every single time they go out and they service the buoy they also get an extracted chlorophyll value so a lab-based extracted chlorophyll value and what we can see is that you know actually the extracted chlorophyll and cell density are positively correlated it's not a great relationship but it's not, it's not that weird relationship that we're seeing with the sensor. So there's, there's some positive correlation to cell density. There's a stronger correlation to biovolume, but there's no correlation to uh, when, we, when we use the sensor. So this is fluorescence versus 
a physical chlorophyll extraction where you're freezing, you know, freezing the cells and getting the chlorophyll out of the cells. Um, but you know, the kind of the, the good news is that a, a simple multiple linear regression is able to really easily reconstruct this relationship. So, you know, 87% of the variation in that extracted chlorophyll can be achieved using the in situ measurements of chlorophyll and phycocyanin. Um, and I'm just, I'll just kind of say, you know, the, the reason, the reason that this is the, the kind of cause of this discrepancy is that um, cyanobacteria, I guess, contain chlorophyll in a, in a different photosystem than eukaryotic algae. And that photosystem is just fluoresces much, much more poorly. So while chlorophyll is an excellent, while extracted chlorophyll is an excellent proxy for cyanobacteria, as, as we've been discussing today, um, this in situ chlorophyll, you've really got to got to work with it to get there. And a, another kind of interesting piece of this is to think about how, um, you know, what happens to the U eukaryotic algae population during a cyanobacterial bloom. So in, in the Charles River, what we've seen is that during the bloom period, you know, more than 95% of all of that algae that, that we look at under the slide is a phanosominin. So there's actually, you know, there may be kind of a decrease in green algae, which would have very easy to measure chlorophyll during the bloom period. Kind of move on to this task of uh, what can we do to what can we do to model the total cyanobacteria in the in the river if we want to get cells per milliliter if we want to come up with something that's compatible with the Massachusetts um, Department of Public Health advisories you know what what can we use and phycocyanin it's it's absolutely useful this estimated chlorophyll. It's, it's okay, we can do that. We can use this reconstructed chlorophyll metric to kind of figure out how much cyanobacteria is in the river. But amazingly, uh, turbidity, turbidity does a really, really good job. Um, you know, an, an R squared value of almost 0.9. And this is the, you know, this equation, it's not gonna be the same for every, for every water body, but um, you know, what this equation is, is it's a coefficient multiplied by turbidity, the turbidity reading minus the background turbidity reading. So, I, you know, my suggestion for anybody who thinks this might be interesting, anybody who thinks, oh, you know, I'd love to be able to kind of take a guess about um, what our cell, our cell density might be, you know, you might want to take a look at turbidity. It's very easy to measure, you know, the instrumentation for uh, doing these measurements is, is much less expensive than, than it is for doing uh, in C2 fluorescence. And when you put that all together, what we can do is we can start to use the EPA buoy to reconstruct or to construct an estimate of, um, of cell density over the years. And, and, this, is, and this is that model and it's co it's color coded kind of according to the probability that our concentration is above 20,000 cells per milliliter and you know what i find really interesting here is that we had uh, we had data from 2015 2016 when the department of public health was going out there and doing a lot of really really good sampling they had to kind of cut their budget or change their priorities a little bit, and um, now are only doing sampling, you know, three or four or you know half a half a dozen times a season. But we we're able to use their data from 2015, 2016, and and our data from 2017, 18, and 19, and one model fit all five of these years. So the you know these open circles that you see on the plots. These are um, these are the actual measurements that you know come either from the Department of Public Health's contracted lab or from our lab at Northeastern. And in terms of 
how well can we determine whether or not a bloom is happening? Um, you know, this is like a confusion matrix approach. And, and basically what, what we can see is that we can detect the bloom conditions with a, a true positive rate of 95%, um, which is a, a very strong result for an app, a, a public health application or kind of a long-term monitoring um, application. And yeah, talk about how this data compares to the MWRA's data. So the MWRA is, you know, collecting chlorophyll data with an eye towards understanding, you know, long-term trends in eutrophication. And, and what they use, which is very commonly used, is this uh, seasonal mean chlorophyll concentration. And the Charles River has a, has a target to achieve a seasonal mean chlorophyll concentration of 10 micrograms per liter. And you know what we found was that the, the sensor output is very compatible with, with those measurements. They, they come up with very similar numbers. But an, an interesting result was that you know in the five years that we were able to do the study in the five years that the EPA buoy has been online at this location, um, those are five years in which the mean summer, the mean summer chlorophyll concentration, has been relatively close to this target. And, uh, and you know, this is, this is kind of more of food for thought than a, than a really kind of concrete observation. But, but what we see is that even as we're approaching this target, you know, we see a clear, I, I believe this is a clear relationship between the mean, the mean summer chlorophyll concentration and the bloom duration, which is what you'd expect. Um, but we also see that even as we're approaching this 10 micrograms per liter chlorophyll target, we're still, we're still having blooms that have quite a long duration. So I think, um, I think that this approach of thinking not just about mean chlorophyll concentration, but also thinking about bloom duration and bloom intensity is potentially going to be useful for us as we kind of evaluate Oh, how well are our rivers recovering from eutrophication? You know, are these uh, nutrient reduction efforts that we're making working? Um, so, you know, that that's my my plug, you know, to, to this group. And I'm interested in what other people are doing and thinking about, you know, how, how does our picture of these water bodies that we care about change as we start really paying attention to long term trends in bloom duration? And then, and then finally, just to you know, hit this home a little bit, um, back to these original three questions. How can we use optical sensors? Well, a turbidity-based model, a very simple turbidity-based model can really give us a lot of information. Um, what about chlorophyll? If you're looking at in-situ chlorophyll measurements, know that during blooms, those measurements are gonna decrease but you can reconstruct them using multiple linear regression. And you know, finally, how do we apply this work to understand regulations and continued monitoring efforts? Um, you know, I'm, I would suggest that these models can help us use, you know, use buoys and sensor data to start creating uh, you know, a, a new long-term record of bloom duration onset timing um, and really, really inform these TMBLs. And then, you know, a, a, a another little piece here is that the Department of Public Health right now, what they do on the Charles River is they, they're very reliant on uh, folks who are spending time on the river to, uh, you know, let, let them know that there is a you know, visible scum and these models can provide a very, you know, a very objective and a, and a pretty reliable kind of automated indication of when those blooms are starting and when those blooms are potentially ending. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was, was somewhat uh, interesting or, or informative. Um, and I will just say this and, 
you know, is published in a bit more data in science of the total environment. And um, I put a link in the chat, but if you need a PDF and can't get it, please send me an email and I would love to send it to you. Um, and I see some great questions that I will look forward to discussing with folks um, in the breakout room. Thank you so much.